Wow, every morning, 8.5 million people wake up in New York City. But the Big Apple doesn't belong only to humans. This is the city of ants. There are 17 billion of them here. They live in houses, hide in the grass, crawl under asphalt, and climb trees. For every New Yorker, there's a sneaker box filled with ants. City ants are more fortunate than their forest cousins. They don't have any need to look for food. Millions of people leave behind tons of hot dog crumbs, pizza slices, and coffee drips. Insects just have to wait for a lunch break in an office building. Then they gather around benches in the park or cafe tables. A lot of food is waiting for them there. Over 1 billion! That's how many ants are running through the streets and parks of Manhattan. And in this ocean of insects, scientists have been able to spot tiny reddish-brown creatures. These insects don't fit into any of the 13,000 ant species known to science. They're unique and only live in Manhattan. Their kingdom is between 63rd and 76th streets. Scientists don't know how long the Manhattans <laughs> have evolved in isolation. They arrived in the US on ships from Europe and were cut off from the rest of the city's infrastructure. But why go anywhere else if there's enough food? The Manhattan loves fast food, especially corn syrup. Because of such a diet, the insect's body has an increased carbon content. This isn't a problem for the ant, though. Carbon helps it adapt to the dry, warm weather of the concrete jungle. Around 20% of New York City is parks and green spaces. White-footed mice live in these places. Scientists have found out that the mice that live in New York have evolved. They're different from their village relatives. These changes are genetical. It's caused by the diet of white-footed rodents that feed on human food waste. For example, New York mice need enlarged livers to process fatty acids from fast food. Central Park in New York is almost twice the size of the Principality of Monaco. A unique centipede is only found in this green area. The creature, called Hoffman's Dwarf Centipede, doesn't grow any longer than 0.4 inches. It lives in heaps of dry plants and runs on 41 pairs of legs. This crustacean, measuring only a bit more than 0.3 inches, is called the Socorro isopod. It's one of the rarest animals on the planet. The creature can only be found in a small thermal spring near Socorro, New Mexico. The isopod lives in the water as warm as 90 degrees Fahrenheit and covered with a layer of algae. These are ideal conditions for the creature. To get to Mobile Cave, you'd have to rappel 65 feet down. That's the height of a four-story building. After that, you'd crawl through narrow passages and swim along a canal with cold water. Sunlight can't get into the cave. The air is poisoned by vapors of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. This extreme place has been isolated from the outside world for 5.5 million years. A unique ecosystem has formed in this toxic atmosphere. Of all the animals that live there, 33 species of millipedes, scorpions, spiders, and leeches can't be found anywhere else on Earth. These creatures are mostly blind and colorless. Well, why would you need eyes in disguise if you live in complete darkness? Movile's coolest guy is the venomous centipede. Scientists have nicknamed this animal the king of the cave. It doesn't grow more than 2 inches, but for this world, it's a giant. The blind salamander would feel great in the company of strange animals from Movile. But these little monsters are separated by the ocean and thousands of miles. The Movile Cave is located in Romania, where these beauties live only in Texas. Their home is an underground body of water in the San Marcos area. These salamanders grow to be 5 inches long. The name makes it pretty clear that the animal is blind. It does have eyes, but they're pretty much useless. This doesn't stop the salamander from being a skilled snail and shrimp hunter. It senses other animals by feeling the underwater waves they create while moving. The Scottish wildcat lives in the north of Scotland. This animal is different from domestic cats, which love sleeping on the couch. Unlike them, it's a perfect hunter. The creature is 25% larger than the average cat. It's muscular and long-legged. The wild cat's tail is blunt and fluffy, covered in black rings with a black tip on the end. 
The quokka is called the world's happiest animal. Just look at its smile. This fluffy animal seems to always be ready for a photo shoot. Quokkas are only found in Australia. Around 10,000 animals live on Rottnest Island and several other locations. The creature's cute smile is an evolutionary trait. An open mouth helps it breathe and regulates its body temperature. Oh, by the way, if you try to feed a quokka, you'll have to pay a fine of more than 200 bucks. This baby will feel comfortable even if you put it on your little finger. The animal lives only on the island of Madagascar. Scientists have found just two tiny reptiles, a male and a female. The researchers have named the nano chameleon Brochesia nana. It's a mystery to them why it doesn't grow larger than a sunflower seed. The next animal on the list also lives only in Madagascar. Locals call this creature ai ai. The unusual lemur spends most of its life in trees and leads a nocturnal lifestyle. This might explain why it looks so tired. Even though the ai ai is a lemur, its teeth are like those of a rodent. Its claws resemble sloth's claws, and its body looks like that of a monkey. The animal's fingers and toes are especially frightening. They're long and thin, with pointy claws. <laughs> Get equipped for any season with brand new Brightside merch. Click the link and grab your print. This is a giraffe with its trademark long neck. A zebra is grazing nearby. Black and white stripes on its body help the animal reflect sunlight during the day and keep it warm at night. But what if you combine these animals? No need, nature has done this work for you. The okapi looks like a giraffe with a short neck, horse body, and zebra stripes on its legs. The okapi has a long tongue. Males have small giraffe horns on their heads. You can only meet these unusual animals in the African rainforest. If you decide to travel around Africa afterward, you must visit the Ethiopian highlands. That's where you see unique gelada monkeys. And no, they're not named after the Italian ice cream. That's gelato. Don't mix that up. Males look like rock stars from the 70s. They're bright and have cool hair. But don't mess with these animals. They are too friendly. Gelatas spend most of their time on the ground. And the main part of their diet is the grass they collect during the day. Scientists believe that gelatas are the remaining members of an ancient gang of critters. It lived millions of years ago in vast spaces from South Africa to India. Now, imagine people the size of the Statue of Liberty living next to us. Sounds like science fiction. But for the animal world, this is reality. The world's smallest tortoise species, the speckled tortoise, doesn't grow more than 4 inches long. But the Galapagos Islands are home to giant tortoises that reach the length of 5 feet. They also weigh like a sports bike. The largest of them had an incredible weight of a thousand pounds. The giant Galapagos tortoise lives for a hundred years and sleeps 16 hours a day. Due to its slow metabolism, the animal may not eat or drink water for a whole year. Millions of years ago, lizards from South America climbed onto a log. Sea waves carried the log to the Pacific Ocean. The lizards traveled hundreds of miles and ended up on the Galapagos Islands they had to evolve to adapt to new conditions. Scientists believe this is how the marine iguanas appear. These unique animals look like dangerous dragons. But in fact, they feed on plants and are totally harmless. Iguanas spend most of their lives in water. To get rid of sea salt that accumulates in the body, these animals literally sneeze salt. A uh, chew! The lyrebird lives only in southeastern Australia and the island of Tasmania. The bird has such a strange name because of its tail. It looks like a lyre, a stringed instrument of the ancient Greeks. Lyre birds are known for their ability to imitate other birds, and not only them. The bird copies animal screams, human voices, chainsaw noises, car and fire alarms, and even the click of a camera. About 12,000 years ago, a salt lake appeared on one of Palau's islands. Today, it's called Jellyfish Lake. This 1,500 by 500 foot reservoir is home to 5 million golden jellyfish. These unique creatures swim to the west shore of the lake every morning. There, jellyfish wait for the sunrise. 
then all day long, they follow the sun. Algae lives in the tissues of the jellyfish, feeding them with energy. These algaes can't live without sunlight. Is the Big Apple getting a little too heavy for its own good? A recent study revealed that New York City is sinking. And get this, it's all because of those towering skyscrapers. Apparently, the whole event is called subsidence, which is when the Earth's surface settles bit by bit, or suddenly sinks. Soft sediments shifting, and the weight of the city itself, are the culprits behind this sinking sensation. Now, don't get too alarmed. The study found that New York is sinking at a rate of 0.04 to 0.07 inches per year. Sure, that doesn't sound like much, but there are parts of the city that are sinking even faster than that. This sinking situation could cause some trouble for the city especially since it's already pretty low-lying and home to over 8 million people. So it's important that local authorities come up with some strategies to tackle the growing flood risk and rising sea levels. Although, I'm not sure building giant seawalls is the way to go. We might need to get a little more creative than that. Geologists want to make sure we're all aware that building more high-rises near the coast, rivers, or lakes could contribute to future flood risks. So we really need to think twice before we start constructing skyscrapers left and right. In recent studies, scientists calculated the total mass of all the buildings in New York City, over 1 million of them, and it adds up to a whopping 1.68 trillion pounds. Talk about a heavy load. Now, they didn't include the weight of the roads, sidewalks, bridges, and other paved areas, so you can only imagine how much more weight is added to the city. But hey, even with these limitations, the researchers did a pretty good job of accounting for the complex geology beneath New York, including the sand, silt, clay deposits, and good old bedrock. They found out that certain types of soil, like clay and artificial fill, are more prone to subsidence. On the other hand, bedrock stays pretty firm and keeps those skyscrapers in place. So at least we don't have to worry about the Empire State Building taking a dive anytime soon. Comparing their fancy models with satellite data, the researchers created a map of the city showing where the sinking is happening. And guess what? The increased urbanization and all that groundwater pumping and draining are only making things worse. It's high time we start protecting our resources, don't you think? I wouldn't start packing my bags just yet. New York isn't the only sinking city out there, you know. Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, is facing some serious sinking action too. In fact, parts of it could be underwater by 2050. That's like a real-life Atlantis situation. Over 30 million people in Jakarta are now deciding if they should relocate the entire city. If there's a city out there we should worry about sinking, that's Venice for sure. But why is it so eager to take a dive, you might ask? Well, let me tell you the complex truth. You see, Venice decided to set up shop on a marshy lagoon with shoddy foundations. As time went by, the ground underneath just couldn't hold it together and started compacting like a squished marshmallow. On top of that, the city's been slurping up groundwater like it's going out of style or something. The cherry on top of this mushy cake is that the sea levels have also been slowly rising. And guess what? those sneaky plate tectonics are having a laugh by shoving the Adriatic plate under the Apennine Mountains, giving Venice an extra push downward. Someone had the bright idea to stop pumping groundwater, thinking they could stop the sinking shenanigans. But hold your gondolas! A new study revealed that the sinking hasn't completely stopped, just slowed down a bit. It turns out the whole area is tilting ever so slightly to the east, with Venice perched on the slightly higher end. You must be wondering how much Venice sinks in a year, right? Brace yourself for this shocking revelation! 
It's sinking at a rate of about 0.04 to 0.07 inches a year, similar to New York. At this pace, in the next 20 years, it could sink a whopping 3 inches below sea level. To avoid turning into a Venetian fishbowl, locals are frantically building special barriers to keep the water from crashing into the lagoon. But don't hold your breath, because this project has had more delays than you'd expect. Oh, and have you noticed that charming old-style vibe in Venice? It's not just because they're fans of the vintage look. Those salty waters have been wreaking havoc on the buildings, thanks to the water levels constantly breaching the original damp proofing. Now the water's cozying up to the masonry, and the ground floors of many apartments are no longer safe enough to live in. Now, when will Venice take a dive into the abyss? It's hard to say for sure. Subsidence and rising sea levels are as slow and unpredictable as a turtle in a marathon. But experts have playfully warned that if things continue as they are, Venice could be doing the backstroke beneath the waves by 2100. Fear not, though. They're doing their best to protect this floating gem of history and culture from becoming a Hollywood disaster flick. So don't cancel that Venice day trip just yet. New Orleans has a peculiar watery situation going on too. You see, this lively place was initially built just a smidge above sea level, and now it's gradually sinking. Back in the day, when an area of the city called the French Quarter was just popping up, folks had to make do with what they had. They scored the best land they could find but it was only about 10 feet above sea level. And let's not forget, the rest of the city is as flat as a pancake, with the areas around the French Quarter being just a hair lower. Now, even though they knew they were up against some soggy odds, the resourceful New Orleans residents did their best to elevate their houses above the flood-prone land they chose as their home. There's more. The ground beneath New Orleans is as wobbly as a plate of jello. Architects had to keep things short and sweet because they feared the soil couldn't handle the weight of taller structures. They played it safe, sticking to two or two and a half stories. Here's where it gets interesting. The city installed a fancy drainage system in the 1900s, thinking it would solve their water woes. And while it did help with the marshes and all, it inadvertently sucked the life out of the soil. Yep, the ground was left high and dry, without enough sediment and water to keep it steady. As a result, those former marshes sank as if they were in a quicksand competition. By the 1930s, things got even more topsy-turvy. One third of the city was below sea level, and by the time Hurricane Katrina made its grand entrance, that number skyrocketed to around 50%. Oh, and here's the icing on the cake. Sea levels decided to join the party, rising faster than a helium balloon. So now, not only is New Orleans sinking, but the surrounding area is also at various degrees below sea level. So what can we do about all these sinking cities? Well, for instance, we could manage our water consumption a bit better. We can't just keep sucking groundwater out of the earth like there's no tomorrow. We've got to find new ways to quench our urban center's thirst. Think about it. We could purify surface waters, or even turn salty seawater into a sweet solution. Of course, we'll need a boatload of energy to make it all work. Speaking of great urban water management, let me tell you about a town in Denmark called Nye. These guys have got it all figured out. They collect rainwater and use it to supply their toilets and washing machines. Talk about resourcefulness. Now that's what I call a splash of genius. Here's a riddle. Which U.S. city is so loved that its name should be repeated twice? You guessed it. New York, New York. But the thing is, how much of New York do we really know? I'm talking about the city that lies under the city. Dare to join me on an underground tour of the Big Apple? Then grab a flashlight, it's about to get dark. We'll start in the heart of Manhattan, in the front of the Romanesque City Hall building. Believe it or not, 
Beneath our feet lies New York's oldest subway station, known as the Old City Hall Station. It opened in 1904 on October 27th, a night of true celebration for New Yorkers. People were so excited, some of them spent the entire night riding the trains back and forth. Before this, urban dwellers moved around in carriages pulled by horses. No wonder the subway was such a hit. You might feel like a time traveler stepping inside the old city hall station. The architecture is dazzling and one of a kind. They sure don't make subway stations like this one anymore. Fun fact, the old city hall station would cost $6.2 million if it was built today. Back in the day, it had dozens of brass chandeliers hanging around. It was one of the few spots in town with functioning electricity. And oh, not to mention brand new multicolored tiled arches and stained glass ceilings you can still see today. Impressive, huh? If you decide to wander down the tracks, you might be in for a treat. Underground New York is as fascinating as the city above the ground. But one thing we usually take for granted is the behind the scenes of what the Big Apple needs to function. Down here, you might see one or two of New York's pneumatic mail tubes. These tubes were built back in the 1800s and they were operational up until the 1950s. They were responsible for distributing people's mail through different post offices. Letters flew at an impressive speed of 35 miles per hour. That's almost as fast as a professional runner. It sure sounds like a useful system. But I have to say, it feels weird imagining people's correspondence flying around 15 feet underground. Back to street level. We'll wander around fancy Lexington and Park Avenues. If you look up, you'll see the famous Waldorf Astoria five-star hotel. Many celebrities have stayed there, including John Lennon and Yoko Ono, as well as presidents such as FDR. This is why the hotel used a secret infrastructure to sneak people inside and out. Under the building, a tunnel known as Track 61 connected the Waldorf Astoria to Grand Central Station. The track was deactivated in the late 70s, but some people say Andy Warhol threw a party there in the 80s. I bet that was something. For the next part of our visit, we'll have to take the subway uptown. We'll get off at 125th Street and find ourselves on the scenic waterfront of Riverside Park. Here, you'll find abandoned tracks of an old metro line. If you follow the tracks, you'll get to an underground graffiti gallery, aka the Freedom Tunnel. The tunnel is named after a graffiti artist from the 80s, who is commonly known as Freedom. While exploring these tunnels, we'll see over 40 graffiti pieces he painted over 15 years. There are spray paints of James Dean, Mona Lisa, and even a self-portrait of Freedom himself. Moving on, let's wander around the northern part of NYC for a bit. Walking in Van Cortlandt Park will feel like hiking upstate, but believe me, you're still in the city. Along the way, you'll encounter some big ventilation towers made of stone. These towers were once part of an old New York infrastructure. They make up the remains of what used to be the Croton Aqueduct. In the 1800s, the city's water supply flowed through a 41-mile-long underground tunnel, all the way from Croton River in upstate New York to Bryant Park in midtown Manhattan. Oh yes, and I should probably tell you that Bryant Park wasn't a park. Instead, it hosted a colossal stone structure that looked pretty much like something ancient Egyptians would build. This four-acre structure served as the city's water reservoir. It even had a pathway on top so that people could enjoy a nice afternoon stroll while looking at the reservoir's crystalline water. Now, all this exploring might have made you hungry, but don't worry, our next stop includes a yummy treat. We'll have to leave Manhattan and make our way to Brooklyn. In case you didn't know, New York City is made of five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. Crown Heights, that's our stop. Would you believe me if I told you that beneath these streets lie caves full of aging cheese? How very Parisian of them. To get down there, you'll have to make your way through a century-old building that now works as an office space. Maybe wave hello to all those hard-working people and disappear in one of the stairways that will take you 30 feet below the ground. You won't need a flashlight for this one. The caves are bright and renovated and can hold up to 22,000 pounds of cheese. But hey, it might stink. That's the main reason cheesemakers decided to use underground tunnels to age cheese in the first place. 
After a bite or two of some delicious cheese, let's keep going. While still in Brooklyn, you might see tons of locals enjoying a sunny day in the McCarran Park Pool. This pool is a huge attraction, being three times the size of an Olympic pool. As the NYC explorer you are becoming, you might even go for a swim. But hey, there's a much more interesting part to this attraction. The pool was built in the early 1900s, but it was shut down in the 50s. During this time, urban explorers discovered a network of underground tunnels right beneath the pool. And, of course, you can find a secret entrance and get a peek for yourself. There, you'll not only see the pool's filtration and heating system, but also a lot of graffiti from the time the site was abandoned. Neat! This question may sound weird, but have you ever seen a cow in New York? I sure haven't. Well, maybe there's a reason for that. Apparently, New York still has underground tunnels that were constructed for the transportation of cattle. Once New York started to flood with automobiles, cows became a burden for traffic. Until a 200-foot-long cow passage was built below 12th Street to transport the livestock that was ferried over from New Jersey. These days, you won't be able to visit this place in person because the tunnel was most likely destroyed. But historians found blueprints proving its existence. To add to the list, archaeologists discovered a very peculiar fossil a while back. Now, imagine peeling off the layers of the city's soil. First, at 15 inches, you'll find a layer of wires. I'm talking TV cables, electricity, and all that. Digging deeper, at 4 feet, you'll see water and sewage pipes. But then, at 15 feet down under the surface of NYC, diggers have found a fossilized shipwreck. The wreck is located right under Broad Street, where there was once shallow water. They believe the wreck dates back to the 1600s. It's 92 feet long and 25 feet wide. Oh, and that's not all. At the intersection of Bowery and Canal Street, engineers stumbled upon a room with its walls and ceiling covered in mirrors. And no one has managed to explain the existence of this bizarre place yet. Our Big Apple underground visit is coming to an end. But we sure did more than just scratch the surface on this one. Before we finish, let's enjoy the best of what NYC cuisine has to offer. A good old bagel. Who knows, maybe next time we'll do Paris or even London. See you soon, Explorer. Well, looky here. It's New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps, Hong Kong on the Hudson, the greatest city in the world, New York, New York, the city so nice they named it twice. All right, I'll stop. You thought you knew this city so well, but underneath all that glitz and glamour is a facade, literally. New York is populated with some of the most iconic urban buildings in the world and home to some of the most unique and famous towers. Who would have known that New York was a front for fake buildings? And the cool thing is that there are plenty to search for. Okay, I'm adding that to my bucket list. So the question is, why do they put these fake buildings all over New York? The city is one of the most vibrant places in the world and requires many infrastructures to keep the city in motion. That means having many industrial structures and buildings in every major district. New York is charming for the design and the buildings. Imagine having industrial structures right next to your favorite pizza parlor or hot dog stand. The designers thought ahead and decided to disguise those industrial infrastructures as fake buildings. They blend with the city so well that they don't stand out. They look like your good old apartment or housing unit with a front door, real-life windows, and even charming balconies where people would hang out. The only thing is that there's nothing behind the facade and no one is allowed inside. So where in the world can you find these fake buildings? For starters, one of the most popular fake buildings is in Brooklyn. At 58 Giralamon Street, you can find a very typical neighborhood. But between the buildings stands a brick building with a slightly deeper shade than the rest. It has bright open windows that blend in with the rest of the buildings in the neighborhood, except that they're blacked out. At first glance, you might not think of it as anything. But if you pay close attention, the building looks like a glitch from a video game. It was built in 1847, way before New York was considered glamorous. Originally, it was meant to be a regular building, but in 1908, they converted it into a fake building. Don't think you can just try to break in. 
Even if you could, it's pointless, because it's part of a ventilation fan for the subway. It also serves as an emergency exit for some of the surrounding buildings. Actually, throughout New York, many fake buildings exist to disguise the subway vents for the smoke to escape. All the way to 415 Bruckner Boulevard, the Bronx, this townhouse was designed by the Switzer Group, which is an interior architect company. It's not as charming as the one at 58 Jorah Lemon Street, but it serves a similar purpose – to hide an electric substation for New York's utility company. The city needs these substations to reduce the high-voltage electricity to a lower voltage so it can be distributed locally. Having a building like this popping out of the middle of your neighborhood isn't exactly the smartest way to attract people to the Bronx. That's why the fake townhouse facade is the perfect camouflage. Now, some of these fake buildings don't really hit the mark and stick out like a sore thumb. The people of Manhattan describe the Mulry Square infrastructure as a complete clunker. After plenty of redesigns and back to the drawing board meetings, the result is still not pretty. The locals compare it to a concrete box. They created windows without glass, which doesn't allow the building to blend in with the rest of the neighborhood. But it beats a typical subway ventilation plant either way. There are just so many places to visit and cross off your bucket list. But if you live in China, you can literally stay in the country and visit many iconic cities around the world. The replica cities began when the Chinese economy started booming in the early 90s. They wanted the lifestyle of the rich and famous without wanting to leave their country. They can be comfortable eating their local food and get the feeling of being abroad. The Chinese province of Guangdong has an identical copy of the historical Australian alpine village Hallstatt. The real Hallstatt is centuries old and one of the most charming places to discover. The local people of Hallstatt also had no idea that their home was being built in China. Some people thought that this was controversial, probably because it cost around $940 million to build it. Paris is undoubtedly one of the most charming cities you could ever visit. Its rich history and vibrant culture are enough to catch the first plane to go there. For residents of Tian Du Cheng, that's something they can do anytime they want. The city is also known as Sky City and has a replica of the Eiffel Tower that looks eerily like the iconic one in Paris and built buildings to match the city's visual charm. One of the main things that will break the charm is the farmland surrounding the city. There's barely anyone there, and the streets are always empty, very un-Paris-like. Still, you can find some nice fountains and statues scattered along the streets to give it some spirit. There's laundry hung everywhere, even on the trees. The picturesque fountains are dry and many apartments are empty. Only a few stores are open for business. Even though this looks like a fake city, it's quite real. Some people live here because it's more affordable than other places. Two hours away from this town is another version of Paris's Pont Alexandre III and a carbon copy of London's Tower Bridge, but with four towers instead of two. Hey, such a bargain! You can also visit the closest thing to Italy, but this time you can go shopping. Florentia Village is an outlet mall that offers an array of shops to lose yourself. The good thing is that this was built by an Italian developer to capture the essence of an Italian village. It has fountains, canals, and mosaics for proper aesthetics. It began in 2011 and has more than 200 shops with many Italian brands and British, US, and Chinese brands as well. The place is so popular that it gets between 10,000 and 25,000 visitors per day. China also has other replica towns that put you in a mini Manhattan called the Yuzhipu Financial District. The developer's goal was to make this place the financial center of the world. It was complete with the right landmarks, like the Rockefeller and Lincoln Centers, but the project was halted in 2019, leaving it mainly empty. You can find a typical English town with cobbled streets, Victorian homes, and restaurants that make Thames Town. This place was meant to recreate a European lifestyle fantasy without leaving Shanghai. China also has a Dutch town that has some elements of Amsterdam with windmills and famous canals. They even decided to copy some of the landmarks, like the Netherlands Maritime Museum. Here's a bonus story of Lebanon's thinnest building built out of a dispute. It's the story of two brothers who both inherited unequal plots of land. 
One of the brothers happened to get a very thin plot of land and couldn't help but be jealous of his brother's nice plot of land. He wasn't pleased. Both of the lands overlooked the Mediterranean Sea in a lively neighborhood of Beirut. So it's no wonder that both brothers couldn't agree on how they should develop their lands. It was obvious that the brother with the most land could build a proper building. The other brother had to improvise. He decided to obstruct his brother's property by constructing a thin building enough to only fit 14 feet at its widest and 2 feet at its most narrow. It was constructed in 1954, and the locals of the area know it as the Grudge. The crazy thing is that the place was once habitable with many visitors enjoying their stay. It's not easy to live there, but it's part of living the experience. The building is still standing, but is empty. Welcome to one of the most iconic buildings in New York City. Its official name is the Fuller Building. But thanks to the sharp 25-degree top corner, people began to associate the tower with a flat iron. And today, the name Flatiron is stuck both to the skyscraper and the entire district around it. This unusual cake slice shape has turned the building into a famous tourist destination. It has popped out in many movies, TV programs, and magazines. So you probably recognize this property, even if you've never been to Manhattan. Surprisingly, today the 285-foot-tall Flatiron is almost empty. And these fancy walls hide a pretty mysterious dispute between their owners. But first things first. In 1901, construction enterprise Fuller Company purchased a sharp triangular plot of land on the crossroad between Broadway and Fifth Avenue. They hired an architect from Chicago, Daniel Burnham, to design the company's new headquarters. The task was to maximize every inch of available space. So Burnham produced a project of a 22-story triangular tower made of steel. The Flatiron Building resembled the shape of a Greek column, which means that its top and bottom are slightly wider than the middle. Fuller Company approved the design and demolished several old buildings to clear the space for the future tower. Construction progressed rapidly, and it was completed within a year. Yes, they used to be able to do that. The Flatiron became one of the earliest buildings to have steel for its structural frame instead of load-bearing masonry. Also, it became one of New York's first skyscrapers and the first steel skeleton structure visible to the public. The curtain wall cladding was also then innovative. The builders used terracotta and limestone to wrap a chic finished look around the steel structure that carried the building's weight. At that time, many people believed that this unusual architecture would fail to withstand high winds. The project's engineers analyzed the tower's aerodynamics and created a steel frame to fight likely problems with the wind. But people still reported experiencing heavy gusts on the street around the building. The Flatiron Building had a bunch of other issues. As you may imagine, furnishing this tight space was quite a challenge. Also, the tower didn't originally have any bathrooms for females. That's why lady tenants were at a disadvantage at first. But then the management added ladies' rooms and placed them on odd-numbered floors. Meanwhile, bathrooms for males were placed on even-numbered floors. Also, the first elevators in the building operated on a water hydraulic system. So it took over 10 minutes to get to the top. Now you can see why that system didn't catch on. It's not surprising that the media expressed skepticism over the new building. Some even called it Burnham's Folly. But despite the naysayers over the years, the tower has been home to many companies and retail tenants. Also, the Flatiron attracted crowds of people. Gradually, it became a frequent site in paintings and postcards and turned into one of the most popular symbols of New York City itself. In 1929, during the Great Depression, the tower was sold at an auction for only $100,000. And in 1966, it got the status of an official city landmark. It means that any renovation or demolition works are impossible without the official permission of the authorities. Furthermore, in 1989, the Flatiron received the fancy status of a National Historic Landmark. The last tenants left the building in 2019, and it has sat empty ever since due to renovation works, which have triggered many disputes among the building's current owners and future tenants. Most of the owners wanted to turn the building into a hotel. Meanwhile, Nathan Silverstein, 
who owned a 25% stake in the property, wanted to divide it up. Finally, in 2023, the local court organized an auction on the building. The owners who held 75% intended to buy out Silverstein's stake to put an end to all disputes over the future of this building. The bid started from $50 million and the price soared to $190 million thanks to an unexpected bidder, Jacob Garlick. Surprisingly, he beat out everyone and won the auction. Some considered the price that he offered too high because the building required at least $100 million worth of renovation. Hey, it gets better. Garlic disappeared after the auction. He has never paid anything, not even the deposit. And he hasn't yet explained himself to the media. So for now, Garlic's location and intention remains unknown. Little did we know that it's possible to show up at a luxurious auction in New York, outbid everyone, and then just vanish into space. Well, according to some experts from the real estate world, it's a very weird situation for a building auction. Usually, the bidders are asked to prove their funds in advance. Some people suspect that Silverstein asked Garlic to attend the auction on purpose, so that he could boost the price and earn more money. But Silverstein claimed that his relationship with Garlic had been distant. On May 20th, the second auction took place. Garlic was absent, but a coalition of syndicates and previous owners won the bid and acquired the Flatiron for $101 million. They haven't yet announced any plans, so today, the future of the Flatiron remains uncertain. The age of the Flatiron building is only around 121 years. But this famous and beloved symbol of New York has survived so many chapters. From challenging traditional architecture to surviving multiple crises, including the Great Depression. So, chances are that this iconic tower will surprise us in the future. Oh, by the way, the Flatiron is not the only skyscraper with issues in New York City. Here's the famous half-built Leaning Tower of Manhattan. A 670-foot skyscraper is located at the corner of South Street and Maiden Lane on the East River. The tower was to host 80 super-fancy condos to sell for up to $7 million each. The developer also planned to offer yacht services to the tenants. A pre-sale of this luxurious but unfinished project was launched in 2018. But in 2020, the tower began to lean 3 inches to the north. The developer put construction on hold and initiated a huge investigation to figure out why this tower refused to stay straight. Although the reason remains unclear, the consensus appears to be that a weak foundation is to blame. You think? And now, welcome to the Waldorf Astoria a former host to authorities, royal families, and Hollywood stars. And maybe not so welcome. This Art Deco masterpiece is the very place where Marilyn Monroe once stayed and where Grace Kelly got engaged to Monaco's Prince Rainier III. But in 2017, the famous hotel was closed for a multi-billion dollar renovation. The property's new Chinese owners, Anbang Insurance, plan to partially turn the hotel rooms into condo apartments by 2019. The condo price was planned to reach up to $18 million per unit. But eventually, something went wrong, and the date of the project completion was postponed until 2025 at best. Although, according to the media, the renovation might have already cost around $2 billion. Some insiders mention poor coordination within the project caused by the dismissal of its American director. They also blame the property's new owner, Dajia Insurance Group, which took over the project after the chairman of Ambang was sent to prison for fraud in 2018. To date, the future of the Waldorf Astoria remains unclear. So I'd try another hotel if you're visiting the Big Apple. And here's another heartbreak hotel story. In 2019, a development firm, Chetrick Group, launched the construction of a 33-story hotel near Madison Square Garden and Penn Station. The project was supposed to open in 2021 and join the management portfolio of IHG Hotels and Resorts, which runs multiple hotels. However, the developer failed to either repay its loan or complete the construction on time. Meanwhile, the hotel remains unfinished, and the estimated investment for its completion totals around $106 million. Hey, you want to finish the job? 